Okay. Um, I thought today would be a really good opportunity to talk about using your video reference, uh, especially if you've been recording from a device that does not record at 24 frames per second, how we can actually convert that over so that it actually does run at 24 frames per second. Um, this is going to use the Adobe Premiere program. We're going to cover things like how to bring in a new timeline, how to set the timeline to the appropriate uh, frame rate and aspect ratio. And we're also going to talk a little bit about editing things together. And also, um, the last thing that we'll talk about is creating an actual time code that exists as well as exporting your final video. So I'm going to just close this out. This is just a reminder that this information is actually created um, as a PDF as well. So you're welcome to download that from the DocShare uh, on our online classroom. I'm just gonna close this out. What we're looking at here is the welcome screen from Premiere Pro. Now, depending on which version of Premiere Pro uh, you're using, this could be a little bit different, but overall, it's all gonna be essentially the same information might look a little different, the button might be designed a little different, but most of the information is going to remain the same. So the first thing I want to do is just create a new project, and the first thing that it wants to know is what do you want to call it. So I'll just call it Cooley, 24 frames per second, Project 01. And also notice that it's already established itself to a location, but I want to change that location and I'm just going to tell it to go into my documents folder and I'll make a new folder here and call it editing. You might want to create a folder specifically for your acting class and then that's basically all we really need to do uh, for that and when we hit OK we're gonna open up the actual Premiere program. Okay so the first thing that I want to say is don't panic uh, this might look a little bit uh, difficult. There's a lot of different windows. There's a lot going on, but it's really not that difficult once you start getting the hang of it. Down here is your project asset folder. This is where all of the things that you want to use, whether it's images, video files, audio files, whatever happens to be something that you want to use for your project, that would all go right in here. Now if I double click on this, I can navigate over to where my video files are. And you'll notice that inside of this folder, I don't really have anything. Well, that's because right now, my file is sitting on my desktop. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna navigate over to my desktop and I'm gonna find the video that I wanna use. I'm gonna copy it. I'm simply going to put it in with my project. That way, I'm staying nice and organized and I can hit open. Now the first thing to notice down here is this is looking at it inside of what's known as the list view. Down here there's two little buttons and I can see it either as a list or sometimes you might see it just as this. Now there's something about this view that is very helpful. It actually shows you what the video itself is and if I just move my mouse to the left and the right you can actually see the video is even giving me a little preview. Well that's great but there's some information that it's not giving me. If I switch back over to my list view, this is a very important piece of information. This is telling me what my video's frame rate is. Now, as we all know, animation runs traditionally at 24 frames per second, but this video is running at essentially 30 frames per second. Now, what that means is that if you were doing this as a 2D animation and you were using the numbers of the frames that you see in this video, as an actual guide to make your animation, you would be six frames off for every single second of animation. Now what that means is that if you tried to translate those numbers exactly into a 24 frames per second animation, your video would actually start moving much slower, your animation would, than you wanted. Now the solution inside of Premiere is very easy. So if I right click and say new item, I'm going to come up to Sequence. That's what Premiere calls a new timeline. This HDV 
at 1080 at 24 might seem like it's the right size. But unfortunately, if you notice right here, it says 1440 by 1080. That's not actually the resolution for full 1080. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just scroll down just a little bit more and I'm going to find the red 1080 16 by 9 at 24. Now it seems like these two options are very similar, but notice that HDV's first number was 1440, but in reality we're looking for 1920 by 1080. Okay, so while you could use the other one, this is the true 1080p. Okay, so this is the one we're looking for, and I'm going to call this video reference. And just hit OK. Now some other things have opened up for me because up until this point we didn't have a working window to see our video. We also didn't have an actual timeline yet. So now that we have our video and our timeline, I can take my video asset and simply click and drag that over to my timeline. Now when I let go, something is going to happen. It's going to pop this warning up. It says, hey, wait a minute. You made a 24 frames per second timeline, but this video is 30. Why do you have them different? What do you want me to do? So I have two options. I can change the sequence settings, which in some cases might be very useful. But in this case, I'm going to say keep the existing settings because I want this video to instead start working as if it had 24 frames. So I'm going to say keep existing, and there it is. Now, I'm just going to hit the plus, notice the plus button, just on my keyboard, plus, makes me go closer to the video, and minus makes me go further away. If you had a very long video, that would be very useful, but I want to get closer so that I can actually see my work easier. Now, this little icon right here is your scroll bar, okay? This allows you to move through your timeline. Now, this has audio on it, and I can choose whether or not I want to have audio. It really depends. If I'm doing animation that requires me to hear something on camera, for example, whether it's just a sound effect or an actual piece of audio, like a, a dialogue line or music or something that I need to time my animation to, then I can certainly keep it. I can also simply select this, notice it's highlighted, and up here in my effects controller, I can open this volume up and I can just set it to a negative number. Now, as I start to scroll through it, I don't hear that audio anymore, but it still exists, okay? Now, as you can see, if I hit the space bar, I'm actually playing this video in real time. Now, when I say real time, what I'm talking about is that the video itself is playing at the frame rate that it was asked to play at. Now, it may become a problem, depending on the speed of your computer, as to whether or not this can actually play in real time. Now, the videos that we've been creating are pretty small, so it really shouldn't be that much of a problem. But eventually, you might start working with video uh, footage that might be 4K or even higher in the future. And so the computer might really start to work a little extra hard in order to show you how to make this work. So while it should be able to play in real time, I can't guarantee that whatever computer you're working on would. Obviously, the school's computers would. Um, this computer is doing just fine uh, with this kind of file. But I just want everybody to be aware of that. Now, this video is simply walking. And you notice that each character is walking in a different way. And I'm scrubbing so that they move a little faster. And let's just say that what I really wanted were these two figures, OK? Now, if I wanted just this piece from this point on, I can actually cut my video. So in order to cut, I can use my C key. And notice that it looks like a little image of a razor blade. Also over here in my tools, you can see that the razor tool is there. The reason that this is an actual image of a razor blade is because in the olden days when they were actually cutting film, they really did use a razor blade and physically cut the film. Now, 
when I move my mouse over to that line and I just click. Notice now that this is now acting like it's two different pieces of video. And what that means is I can actually take this and just delete it out of my timeline. But the nice thing about it is that video still exists. So if I just move my mouse over to that edge, notice that my icon changes. I can simply drag and all of that video still exists. Okay, so cutting doesn't actually delete the video out of the, t out of the uh, project or out of this video file. It simply chooses the piece that you want to use. So I'm going to let this play through. And once I've reached the end of that sequence, those two characters, I'm going to just clip again and then get rid of the end piece. So if one of the videos that you have is sort of a compilation just so that we see everyone, you can pick and choose what portions of the video you want. But we have a problem now because at the beginning of my timeline, if I just hit play, we have a whole lot of nothing. Well, it's very simple. I just simply select it and drag it back to the beginning. Also notice um, that this is a little work bar and if I drag this forward, I'm actually adding time to the file that I'll be getting. If I choose to do that, then I'm going to either add or subtract video from this. Now you may not actually see this little tool. It's very useful, but by default, uh, Premiere CC doesn't actually have it. So if I right click, inside just where I see the name of my project, I can move up and see it says work area bar. If I click this off, notice that that disappeared. This might be what you see. So again, right click, work area bar, and there it is. Now, I can hit my space bar to play this through. That's working pretty good. And now I want to actually be able to see this as frame numbers. Now if I get closer, just plus, 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 I can see that this is kind of frame numbers right here. This is frame three, that's frame nine. Things are going good, right? But watch what happens when I reach the first second. 23 is still good. We go one further, and now we're seeing a number one. This is called time code. And time code is not the same as frames, okay? Now what I need to do is I need to create a new layer so that I can use time code on top of this. And the reason that I would do that is because inside of a Mac computer, when you're playing a QuickTime file, depending on which version of QuickTime player the Mac has, you may not be able to change that option to actually see the frame rate like you can do on a PC. So what I want to do is I want to have this frame rate on this video permanently so that no matter where I'm watching it, even if I'm watching it on my phone, I can see the frame rate. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back into my assets, right click, go into my new items, and say new transparent video. And using a transparent video, now I've added that to the layer. And of course, a transparent video, you won't see anything because it's transparent. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come over to my effects tab, which if you can't see it right off the bat, um, if you're looking at your window, maybe your resolution of your screen isn't too high. Um, all you need to do is come over to the arrows and say, I want to see the effects tab. But hopefully your resolution on your screen is high enough that you can see that tab automatically. Then I'm going to type in time code. And because I've typed it in, that's the only effect that is now visible. These are full of different effects. So I'm going to select that, click and drag over to transparent video. And what I'm going to do, once I have that selected up inside of my effects controller, I'm going to change the format to frames. And then I'm going to change the time code to generate. Because I'm now generating it from inside of this video, I should be able to start at frame 1 or 0. If I want to start at frame 1, I can change that and say, make it frame 1 by using the offset. 
Um, but I think that since we don't actually see the start of my video yet, that would be essentially frame one. But anyway, if I wanted to, I could say that if I wanted that to be frame one, I could offset it and say negative 26, or excuse me, negative 25. So that now that is actually frame one. Okay. <clears throat> now, this video doesn't officially have this time code in it yet, because if I turn off that layer, notice that it's not part of that other video. So the next thing that we need to do is we need to export this as an actual video file. So what I'm going to do is make sure that this window is highlighted, and you can see that it's highlighted in blue right now. And I'm simply going to, uh, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. If you're on a PC, you can do Control M to make a movie, or you can come over to File, Export, Media, and notice it's Control M. So when I click on Export Media, it's going to bring up this set of options. Inside of Format, up at the top, make sure that you have QuickTime selected. And then for presets, you can open this up. And of the presets that are here, you can use the HD 720p. That's fine. The only difference is we're going to change the quality settings and the resolution. So height, I'm just going to type in 1080 myself. And that'll give us a 1080 by 1920 image. Everybody see that? So I'm going to scroll down and notice that the frame rate is already set to 24. And the other thing that I want to watch out for is the bitrate settings. Now, depending on the quality of your video, the size of your video, how sharp your video needs to stay, you can change this, but I wouldn't go any higher than 15,000 kilobytes um, because that'll still give you a, a relatively sharp image and it won't be too high. Now, I'm going to click on the output name to make sure that we go to the right location and I'm going to export as a reference, creating a new folder. Now it says video reference, and maybe I'll just go ahead and add two walks. Hit save, and then I just have to hit export. Now depending on the length of your video, the speed of your computer, this can take anywhere from a few seconds to several minutes to half an hour. Um, it all depends on the complexity of your project. All right, and that's pretty much it. You've just created a video. If we come over to our reference, I can open this up and we can see how it looks. Now this video is going to have this time code stuck on it the entire time. Now because it's a QuickTime file using the H.264 codec in a, on a PC, I can play it inside of my Windows Media, media video file. But what I'm gonna do is open it up in QuickTime so that I can go frame by frame much easier. And you can see that what I would do is I would find maybe the start frame, right? The left leg is forward, the right leg is back. So then I would play it through if I was going to make a cycle until the left leg is forward, the right leg is back. So it goes from frame one to frame 32, and that is this character's animation cycle. I would use these poses as my guide to make my animation thumbnails. Now of course I could use two different time codes um, if I wanted to start this other student's walk cycle. But if I put it about there, that would be from frame 44, right leg is forward until all right, so this one doesn't actually have an animation cycle, but I could, I could make that happen. Okay, so hopefully this just gives you a little bit of a, a clearer understanding of how all this works. Um, and I am looking forward to seeing what you come up with. All right, so thank you and goodbye.